Chapter 35 to 36. Shortly after Harry's party came to a conclusion, Harry was called to Xavier's office with Rogue and Logan. The moment he entered the door, he got a notification. Ping. New quest, Rogue Powers Assist and Marie with gaining control over her powers. Harry was going to do it anyways, but the quest notification still made him smile. The Ancient One had already concluded that any completed quest would do good for the world which meant Rogue gaining control over her powers would be a great thing. Harry's trust in the quest prompts was one of the reasons he had rationalized giving Danger so much freedom and he was quite proud of his accomplishment. After entering Xavier's office, Rogue removed a glove and they confirmed through some simple tests that Rogue's power had not changed, it simply didn't affect Harry. Xavier stated, Rogue's powers have, to this point, been uncontrollable in nature. I feel this discovery may perhaps be a clue to unraveling a means to provide that control. Harry had heard a number of things about her power from a few of the students, especially Bobby. Children gossip after all, it was in their nature. However he still wanted to hear answers from the source. Harry answered Xavier, maybe, but I'd like a few more details to work with. He turned to Rogue and asked, can you describe your power? Give me as many details as you can please. The look of both hope and pain in her eyes seemed to be fighting each other but after a moment of silence she let out a sigh and answered in a Southern Belle accent. Well, when I touch someone, I feel like I become that person, just for a little while. The longer I touch them, the more that person I become and the longer the effect's gonna last. When I do it to a mutant, I get their powers too. Harry mulled over that for a moment and asked, what's it like to become someone else? She shook her head, I don't know, it's like, I go away just a bit and someone else steps in. I'm them. I get some of their memories and sometimes I forget I'm me. Logan added, even after the power or memories were off, she'll sometimes gain personality traits of those she touches. Those were off too, but the length of time's not always the same. Harry felt a few dots connecting to a conclusion he'd never have thought of. Harry looked up to Logan and asked with an educated guess, did your personality traits last longer in her than other people? Logan remained motionless for a moment before giving a curt nod. Harry added, do you trust her and trust her with your power? Xavier picked up on the direction he was going and asked, you think the length of the effect is determined by the donor's connection to Rogue? Rogue's eyes widened for a bit and said, that would explain Mystique. Still got a bit of her in here somewhere, she said while pointing at her head. Harry figured that meant she'd copied the shapeshifter at some point and they weren't strangers. He turned to Xavier and said, in any case, the reason she can't get anything from me is simple, my power trumps hers. She turned to Harry with a partially offended look which forced Harry to quickly explain himself to avoid a misunderstanding, I mean I can absorb things as well. She can't absorb from another absorber, it cancels out. Harry was pretty sure they'd buy his excuse since it was close enough to the truth. His mutant power was keeping the energy-infused obscurus particles that made up his body together in the shape of a human. If Rogue could absorb the energy contained within his obscurus particles, it would likely cause his form to break down. So his power was directly resisting her power. Not that he knew his power would win out over hers. He was quite worried when he first touched her because the worst case scenario was that she could permanently absorb all the energy of his particles leading to a permanent death. Rogue's posture visibly slumped at Harry's answer but Xavier said, but it seems you have a few ideas Mr. Potter. Harry nodded, dealing with magic is basically just dealing with different types of energies. Rogue's ability to absorb and use energies is not impossible to duplicate with magic. Therefore, there are means of training that could prove useful to her. Logan asked, there are normal guys who can train to do that. Harry nodded and explained, they require a great deal of talent, but in essence, yes. I know of one guy who can permanently drain all the energy out of a person by touching them. Not that he has done so. That is simply an application of what he can do, not the purpose he trains for. Rogue asked, why not? Is there a reason he doesn't? Harry figured she wanted to know if there were consequences to doing so she didn't know about. After considering it for a moment he said, I'll tell you later. It is relevant to you, but there is no need for others to know his business, Harry answered while gesturing to Xavier and Logan. Neither found it offensive such information was not shared with them as long as he would give it freely to Rogue. It was obvious they both cared about her. Harry and Rogue were excused and Harry took Rogue's unloved hand and dragged her over to an empty study. He felt the presence of a certain flame as well as the recently caved-in space that accompanied the arrival of a certain blue prankster behind the open door. Harry didn't mind, he just didn't want Xavier to be analyzing the pair as he gave her the info. Harry sat Rogue down and said, you want to know the consequences of absorbing the energy of someone else? 
Well, the main issue is the taint. The only person you should be is you. When you are someone else, the real you becomes lost. If that guy I know goes around permanently absorbing the energy of everyone he could, he'd certainly become more powerful, but he would permanently lose himself to the taint gained from others and at the end of the day, the one standing in his shoes would not be him, but someone else. A stranger with his memories. Rogue looked frustrated and tried to say without yelling, but they keep telling me I need to practice my powers which means use an M as much as I can. You're saying, the more I use, M, the less me I become? Harry considered it and said, yes, but I don't think it should be that way. Those pieces of others who affect your personality can be considered taint. But this is your power, it shouldn't bring you harm if you're using it right. There should be a way to use it without absorbing taint and remaining yourself. Rogue got up and said, don't you think I've been trying? It's all or nothing every time I touch anyone. I can't, I, she lost her energy and fell back into the couch with a depressed slump. Harry sat down and said, I don't think it's your fault. You may have accumulated too much taint already. There should be a part of your mind you can use to control your power, but it's so gunked up that it's numb to you, preventing you from feeling it out. Rogue sat in silence for a few moments before saying, when my powers first kicked in, I was kissing a boyfriend. It was my first kiss. I didn't know what kisses were supposed to feel like, I just thought it was a hell of a kiss. After a moment of silence she added, he's still in a coma. Harry let out a sigh and said, that's probably what numbed you then. So that's it for me, she asked quietly. Harry shook his head, no. We need to remove the taint and get you back to a clean slate. Professor already tried that, she listlessly replied. Harry continued, he could likely remove the mental aspects, but not the energy, connection, and life force aspects. Taint is not so easily removed. It's supposed to be a consequence of taking what shouldn't be taken. You just got the short end of the straw. Story of my life, she replied smoothly. Harry took her hand again and said, hey, I'm pretty creative all right. Don't give up hope. If nothing else, I promise that if you ever need a hand to hold or a shoulder to cry on, I'll be available, okay? Rogue turned to Harry with glistening eyes and said, can I, can I have a hug? Harry smiled and pulled her into a hug. She felt her first touch of human warmth in who knows how long and a moment later she started sobbing. Harry patted her back and held her tight until she let it out. Outside the room Harry could tell that Jean was using subtle suggestions to the kids walking around to avoid the room and Kurt was threatening terrifying pranks to those who looked like they were approaching. They were both making sure no one disturbed Rogue's moment. Harry really smiled at that. This whole place treated even the outcasts like family. When Rogue was done, she apologized to Harry who said there was nothing to apologize for. She thanked him and after taking a few moments to dry her eyes, she left. Harry moved his hand to the side just as Kurt teleported in and flicked his forehead, reflexively, as he appeared. Jean had hitched a ride teleporting in as well after first teleporting out of the hallway to prevent Rogue from seeing the peepers. Jean cried out, we're not peepers. Harry smiled and said, I didn't say anything. Though he did think it. Jean rolled her eyes and after letting out a sigh said, thanks for helping Rogue. A lot of us really know how bad it is to have no control over their powers and she's always been one of the worst cases. Kurt rubbed his forehead and said, yeah, I have it pretty bad because of how I look, but at least I can be touched. Chicks dig the blue fuzz too. He smiled confidently and nodded while Jean seemed to be questioning her choices in acquaintances. Harry turned to Kurt and said, Forge and I came up with a few neat breakthroughs with hard light and hologram tech while upgrading the danger room. I'll see what can be done about a hard light hologram disguise for you. Kurt didn't hide his surprise and asked, you can do that. Harry gave it a moment to roll the idea through his head and allowed a few points to click together and said, I can try. If it works though, the hard light will press your tail against you, preventing it from swinging around like an extra layer of clothes over everything. It might be uncomfortable. Kurt did a backflip and said, no problem. Going outside nowadays needs like five layers already just to hide my features. I'd love an alternative. Harry nodded and said, might take a few months though. Not for the fabrication, but for the program that writes over your appearance. Writing the whole thing myself would take too long, but I set up the program to write itself after preparing a few things. Danger might be able to help so I'll head down later to ask her. Kurt's smile was infectious and he practically cried out, oh thank you Harry. I can't wait. He then teleported out. Probably to tell others. Jean said, for someone who considers helping people just a hobby, you certainly put a lot of effort into it. 
Harry smiled and said, Ah, have you finally gone through the books on my life and my head? Jean turned away for a moment before saying, I'm sorry. For what? I, I did look at some memories of your childhood. I saw, I saw those awful people. Harry sighed and said, my life before the age of 10 wasn't exactly something that you'd find in a children's story. He hoped she'd pick something more interesting than that. Now however she felt guilty for looking at something so painful. When it comes to pain, there are usually two types of people. There are those who show off their pain to others hoping to garner sympathy for attention or an advantage. And there are those who hide their pain from others because they feel it makes them look weak. Harry obviously wasn't the former, which usually by default would make him the latter. Had it not been for his hundreds of years enjoying a family in the afterlife, he figured he probably would be. Jean asked, so things got better? Harry hesitated on answering. After a moment he said, look it up yourself. You wouldn't believe me if I told you what happened, but yes. Things got better. Deciding to change subjects, Jean started going over her progress in acclimacy, imagery practice, and mental discipline. She was slowly, brick by brick, building up a solid foundation of a mind. While thinking about how much work one normally had to go to build things inside the mind, Harry went over the new feature he got from his last quest. Mindscape copy. It basically took all the work he used to have to do and put it to shame. Harry already had started up a primitive mindscape as a form of mental discipline and knew that to make it worth something, he'd have to put months and years of work into it, even using his various cheats. Mindscape copy however literally let him copy something directly into his mindscape. He could already do something similar with items in his inventory, but now he could do so with things that could not be placed inside his inventory. As long as Harry had enough details on something, he could place a copy of nearly anything into his mindscape. While trying it out, he already created a perfect copy of the tutorial village and the surrounding areas, Hogwarts and Hogsmeade, Camartage, and almost the whole of London. They weren't empty either. They had copies of people walking around like NPCs. He could even copy places the Ancient One showed him while exploring the Astral Plane. Harry even found he could copy things like the Basilisk, Voldemort's Death Eaters, and the monsters he fought in the Astral Plane and during battle meditation. Of course, they did not yield experience when defeated, but it was useful as practice for fighting. That being said, he couldn't copy Voldemort since it was Goose who beat him and he couldn't copy the Mandarin since Harry never beat him. The most useful aspect was that he could grind his paths through combat with the copies, though fighting something you already defeated yielded very little to path rank advancement but it did give Harry a practice ground for different strategies. Of course, not everything could be copied. His copy of Hogwarts didn't have a working room of requirements and if he copied the X-Mansion, it wouldn't have a working danger room. Once Jean had given him her progress report, Harry gave her a new exercise to practice, the art of folding and unfolding sections of the mind. Harry's scan of Xavier showed him how he folded and unfolded sections of his own mind to lock things away. Although he never intended Jean to lock parts of herself away, she needed to learn to unfold her mind using Xavier's method to unlock the phoenix trapped within. Harry explained the dangers of folding the mind permanently and said this was just an exercise that would help her. The following days returned to routine. School would start in another two weeks so it wouldn't be long before more students would be returning to the mansion. Harry finally had near unlimited access to Forge's lab so he could use the tools to make his own gizmos now and there were too many things he wanted to make. Harry knew of course that he didn't really need toys. He didn't need sorcery either. As long as the opponent wasn't magically stronger than he was, there wasn't a single opponent Harry couldn't beat with wizard magic. He didn't even need to be fancy. Voldemort and the Triwizard Tournament Cup proved how easy it was to weaponize portkeys. Harry could set a portkey's destination to the middle of the ocean and just throw it at a target. If they couldn't resist the magic, it was instant defeat. Harry could even make a heavy-duty magic cage and set that as the destination. It wouldn't even be hard. If an opponent couldn't resist magic, Harry could stun them, shrink them, turn them into a frog, or remove all their memories. And that was just using the legal spells he had. There were three reasons Harry did not. The first was that anyone who did not have magic resistance would be a small fry to begin with. Magic resistance just means the body possesses energy that would resist changes caused by exotic energy. That speedster, Pytro, had time energy in his body. It wasn't a lot, but he would likely be able to resist some magics so even if he touched a port key, he'd likely be able to resist long enough to release the object and not get sent to the North Pole. Harry also heard about the Brotherhood's leader, Magneto. That guy sounded like a sorcerer highly proficient in electromagnetic energy. 
he could definitely resist most magics. Not that such people were immune. The ability to resist magic just means that a stunner wouldn't put them down 100% of the time and a cutting curse wouldn't cut as deeply. Strong magic resistance just means it would be a fair fight compared to an easy victory. The second reason was the outward effect. Wizard magic still fried electronics and getting around that was a giant pain. Even danger wasn't a perfect attempt. The wizard magic he gave to her to use would be buried under layers of other things but if any electronics stayed in the danger room for too long, it would likely have corrupted data. Danger and Forge however felt this was acceptable as it would prevent someone from leaving undetectable foreign hardware within. And the final reason was that he wanted it to be a trump card, or better yet, a prank. Why do things the easy way when he can do it the fun way? Why turn your foe into a frog when you can project a hologram around them making it look like their gender changed and they're in a pink dress? Why teleport someone into a cage when you can traumatize them with pranks into turning themselves in? Of course, that was just for fun. Harry still had a few hundred port key galleons with a destination of the North Pole in his inventory. He made them before losing his ability to make portals to be used if needed. If lives were on the line, there would be no shenanigans and no mercy. Until then he was going to continue having fun. Harry's current project was just what he told Kurt. Exterior hard light holograms. He wanted to make a floating sphere he could throw that would track and follow those he threw it at. If the hologram he had in mind worked out, the sphere would be overlaid with an image of the head of the person he threw it at. It would also be on fire and screaming, though he needed to work on the audio. Harry imagines someone acting like a big, tough, bad guy, and suddenly Harry throws their own flaming head at them which stares them in the eye while flying at them while screaming in horror in their own voice. Spurred on by imaging how traumatizing that would be for others was great motivation and Harry got to work right away. Unfortunately, Harry was interrupted three days into his project with a phone call. Only Hermione, Sirius, and the Ancient One had his number, and Hermione called a few days ago and Sirius still hadn't figured out how to use a phone. Harry answered it and unsurprisingly, it was the Ancient One. Through the phone she said, Hello Harry, Kamartaj has a mission for you. Oh, what's going on? Well, some of the acolytes brought a matter to my attention that was discovered through the forum of that website you made. Some investigations were being done using the website and from the pictures posted on the R signs there is a demon kidnapping children from an orphanage in a small town in Pennsylvania. Harry was already putting away the equipment in the lab as he asked, you know I'm not going to refuse to help, but why ask me? The ancient one answered, from what I can tell, the children at the orphanage consists almost entirely of mutant children. Due to this fact, rather than sending backup, it would be advisable to inform your new acquaintances and have them assist you instead. Ping. New quest, rescue the orphan mutants from Nastir. Protect and rescue the captured orphans before they are sacrificed by Nastir, rescue the remaining orphaned mutants from Nanny and Orphan Maker. Ah, I got a quest, Harry commented before reading off the details over the phone. The Ancient One said, well, that confirms a few theories I had. You cannot get a quest to something that is unrelated to you or something you have no knowledge about. Harry wasn't angry but he still had to ask, that was a test. Of course it was. Knowledge about your circumstances will prove vital to using your abilities wisely in the future. Harry answered, true. Have you heard of Nastir? Harry had memorized the Grand Grimoire but although that made him an expert of the 72 demons Solomon commanded and a number of others, that didn't mean he knew them all. There were probably more demons than there were humans if you actually did the numbers. Demons existed on many planes after all. The Ancient One answered, it is not a name I am familiar with in the past or future. That means this is the first time I've encountered it. Harry didn't let that disappoint him and asked, is the forum for that post still up? The Ancient One confirmed it was and hung up. Harry pulled up access to the internet and went into the site before reading the details and printing them out. At the site of the disappearance were some strange symbols and one of the more clever officers at the town searched for similar symbols on the internet which lead them to a match on Harry's website which lead the officer to the forum Harry made sure was followed by some of the more tech-savvy acolytes in Kamartage. The officer who posted in the forum also gave some details on some things he saw at the orphanage. They were passed off as something else, but the ancient one recognized it as signs that the children were mutants. The quest pop-up even proved it. Harry prints out the relevant information and heads over to Xavier's office. As the head of the school so close to reopening, he was quite busy and was currently going through a pile of paperwork on his desk. Seeing this, Harry paused and went over his options. He remembered that most of the X-Men and teachers had actually been out as they were currently being sent to the homes of the students to escort them back to the institute. 
This was done to ensure the safety of the students and to prevent incidents, but it also meant that the bulk of the veteran X-Men were currently out. Logan remained because he was not a people person and was partially charged with security for the institute. However him heading out as well would leave the remaining children vulnerable. Harry unpaused and asked Xavier, when is Storm, Colossus, or Domino returning? In Harry's opinion, of the first Gen X men who remained at the school as teachers, those three were the best to bring because they were strong and good with children. Beast couldn't act in public until the hard light disguise was working and the less said about Forge and children the better. The man was brilliant and knew how to teach, but he wasn't exactly the sympathetic ear a kidnapped orphan would need. Xavier didn't miss the urgency in his voice and answered, Ms. Monroe should be returning in three days while Mr. Rasputin and Ms. Thurman will not be returning until next Monday. What is the matter? Harry sighed and put the papers he'd printed out on Xavier's desk and summarized, there seems to be an orphanage in Pennsylvania that has a lot of mutant kids and someone or something capable of using darker magics have been kidnapping them. My teacher called me and let me know and asked if I would handle it since the victims were mutants. Xavier looked pensive as he read through the papers and commented, I was not aware of any such gathering of mutant children. However Harry's documents were easy to review and the prevalent points about the orphanage and the signs within certainly seemed to indicate the presence of perhaps multiple mutants. But an orphanage of mutants? That was hard to believe as even the act of gathering mutants was not so simple. He should know. Xavier's chair rolled out from his desk and he said, let's visit Cerebro have this looked into. I'll have Logan meet us on the way. Harry followed him out of the office and shortly after Logan showed and was handed the papers Harry had given the professor. Down three flights of stairs they encountered a massive door that was unlocked by Xavier's biometrics. A synthesized voice echoed out, Welcome Professor, upon the door's opening which made no sense to Harry. There was no such voice or automated AI system in any other part of the institute systems besides danger. Harry sighed and figured it was for atmosphere. Cerebro was a massive hollowed-out sphere with a platform in the center and a single walkway extending to it from the entrance. The platform had a control system in the center and a metal helmet. The trio headed in as the door closed behind them while Logan continued reading. The occasional growls he released while going through the information clearly gave his stance on such matters. A warrior like him had an innate protective instinct for children after all. Xavier put on the helmet and said, this is your first time in Cerebro, please remain still while it is active. Harry gave a bare nod as the room came alive with images. The images themselves were not holograms or electronic displays. They were mental projections of Xavier's senses, enhanced many times over through the massive amplifier and displayed in the empty space for observers to see. Xavier concentrated on the coordinates of the orphanage in Pennsylvania but once he did, the images around them began to distort. Logan asked, what's going on Charles? It was apparent he had not seen something like this before. Xavier frowned and said, something is dulling my senses through Cerebro. I need a moment to compensate. The images became clearer then fuzzier then clearer again as he seemed to try different tricks to get around the interference. Moments later the images returned to perfect clarity. Ah, there we go. Now let us see what has been hidden. The images zoomed in and the outline of a building became clear as well as the outline of two dozen children, all glowing orange. In the same building in the basement there appeared to be a blue glow and another orange glow, though the shapes of both were distorted. From what Harry could tell, humans glowed blue and mutants glowed orange on this display. Harry asked, can you find any groups of mutants nearby? The building zoomed out and the map grew to display more area but other than the individual orange dots scattered about, there were no other groups. After another moment of searching, the professor sighed and the images cut as he removed his helmet. Logan asked, what was that about? Xavier answered, there is something in that town which shrouds my senses. Had it blocked my senses completely, it would be more noticeable, but as it only numbed it, I could not notice the mutants within had I not specifically been looking for them in that small area. Logan didn't look surprised, so someone figured out how to hide from you? The tone of his voice made it seem like he'd been expecting it to happen at some point. Xavier nodded and said, indeed, though I cannot be certain if the one they are hiding from is myself or perhaps another. In any case, I was unable to get a reading on the minds of anyone in that town. To gather more information, we'll need a closer look. Logan glanced back at the papers and said, I got a bad feeling about this Chuck. I don't think waiting for the others is a good call. It might be too late by then. Xavier frowned pensively. He knew this was not going to be easy. After discussing the various possibilities and Harry's educated guesses, it was decided to call in Warren Worthington III, also known as Angel, the economics teacher for the institute. 
Once he arrived, Angel would take Shadow Cat, Pixie, the whole of the third X-Men team, and Harry in the X-Men's jet, the Blackbird, to Pennsylvania. Unlike the other teachers, Angel was not fetching students at the moment. Rather, he was still in New York handling various matters of the business he owned. Harry had learned not long ago that this angel-winged economics teacher was the owner of Worthington Industries. Since getting into business himself three years ago Harry had pretty much memorized all the largest businesses and their various subsidiaries. Worthington Industries owned the handful of airline companies which produced the most advanced and sophisticated aviation technologies in the world. They also owned several companies that produced alternative fuels which freed their airlines from the oil market. They also owned one company that produced fancy frozen yogurts. Harry was not sure why. After getting into contact with Warren, Xavier confirmed he was on his way and would be arriving within the hour. Harry used that time to look up the so-called orphanage. There were no public records of it, but the records that mentioned it indirectly stated it was set up a year and a half ago and was called Nanny's Lost Boys and Girls. Harry assumed it was a Peter Pan reference though not exactly clever. Warren arrived after Harry finished what little investigations he could and was given the details. After looking over the paperwork Harry pulled out, Warren said, I've made it my business over the last five years to help mutants, but I've never heard of a mutant orphanage, especially not one so close to home. This seems more than a little suspicious. In case worse comes to worse, I'll make a few calls now to ensure arrangements are made. He didn't elaborate but Harry knew what Angel meant. If they had to take the orphanage down, there would be a lot of homeless kids to take care of. Xavier's Institute was a high school-level boarding school with over 100 rooms, but that didn't give him permission to just bring everyone over. There were legal processes required before such a thing could be sanctioned. Thankfully money talks. Between Xavier's connections and Warren's wealth, they were going to make sure whatever was done was done in the best interests of the children. Before heading into the briefing, Harry went to his room to invite Forget-Me-Not. Meryl was with Domino so the members of the second X-Men team at the mansion were just Pixie and Shadowcat who were both coming. Harry hadn't gotten a confirmation but he figured Forget-Me-Not was as well. When he entered the room, Goose was sitting on her enchanted bed and Forget-Me-Not was out. Harry asked Goose, do you know where Forget-Me-Not went? Goose looked up and answered through their connection, he left a few hours ago. Harry sighed and was about to leave when he turned back and asked, hey Goose, do you want to come fight demons and rescue orphans? After a moment of contemplation, Goose asked, are you going alone? No, I'll have backup. Goose rolled over to get more comfortable and conveyed back, perhaps next time. Harry figured as much but felt she would appreciate being asked even if she was likely to decline. Harry grabbed a backpack and filled it with stuff from his inventory before heading back to the briefing. Warren said, now that everyone's here, let's get started. The papers Harry had printed out had been scanned into a projector Warren used to explain the details for everyone. Warren asked Harry, do you recognize what kind of magic this could be? Harry nodded and took out necklaces and cheap trinkets for everyone before answering, more likely than not, that's demon magic. Everyone please pick something and wear it. It won't provide much protection against demon magic, but it's better than nothing. Kurt picked up a chain and examined it for a moment before stating, this looks like cheap costume jewelry you see pop-ups to buy on the internet. Kitty said, yeah, this is like, tacky. Harry sighed and said, the symbols on the tacky costume jewelry are legit though. Like I said, it's better than nothing. Someone wearing the charm would be difficult to target with demon magic which was quite an advantage, though explaining how that worked or that the custom jewelry company that made these were ones he owned was more trouble than it was worth. Warren sighed and put on a charm bracelet and the rest followed. The plan was to investigate the kidnappings, predict the next one, rescue the kidnapped children, and if necessary, take care of the orphanage. Harry added several points to the plan including some basic spy gear he had which allowed for hacking. This was added to the plan and once they went over a few contingencies, they headed out to the Blackbird. The Blackbird, according to Warren, was built by his father's company and could be considered the most advanced plane on the planet. More so due to the add-ons forged use spare parts from an alien ship to upgrade it with. Jean's mind was occupied with concern over the orphans and the fact that everyone else was concerned over the same matter wasn't helping. Harry invited her into his library where she could spend the rest of the flight in silence going over the various books within Harry's mind. Harry himself was going over the interior of the Blackbird and determining how each aspect worked. He could already tell from the coating on the surface that it had active adaptive camouflage and the engine was using fuel in a way that was far too efficient for normal jets. There was barely any heat coming off it meaning the jet's exterior would be around the same temperature as the air outside. Warren himself was flying with Scott as co-pilot. 
Warren was trying to dissipate everyone's nervousness by teaching Scott how to fly it himself one day. That thought reminded Harry that he needed to magic-proof Dr. McCoy's spectrometer when he returned. Harry had yet to figure out how to make the ultimate riding broom and he wanted to use tech to do it. The potion that was infused into a boom which allowed it to use a wizard's magic to fly had been changed over the course of hundreds of years, but that didn't mean there couldn't be improvements. In addition to that, Harry needed to expand on advertising for his gemstone company. The goblins had already openly bought the parts needed to make many machines capable of creating synthetic gemstones so now that no one was going to ask where they got them, it was time to start producing and selling them in bulk. Harry also needed to network the goblins' computers together. They had to spread out the companies into several areas and rather than using existing phone lines to connect the computers in different areas, Harry was just going to use magic-powered quantum entanglement connections, just like his hack boxes. The only problem was that he would need to acquire several dumb computers in each office and have them actually wired through the phone lines. If they had nothing to transmit info from one building to the other visibly, then the people who tried to hack them would find nothing to hack which would be suspicious. Thankfully the goblins shared his propensity for paranoia and would probably enjoy filing the dumb computers with useless info, false info, and terrible viruses. The flight to the small town was practically shorter than the prep and take-off time due to the speed of the blackbird and the meager distance. The blackbird itself landed in an empty field with its active camo going and quietly landed. Most of the X-Men stayed aboard while Warren, Kitty, Jean and Harry headed to the sheriff's office. Warren's wings were capable of pressing almost completely against his back and beneath the long coat he wore, one wouldn't even notice the bulge on his back unless you really looked, allowing Warren to walk around without issue or stares. Unsurprisingly, the sheriff's office was quite busy due to all the recent commotion. The group headed off to the side of the building and Harry handed Kitty a magic-proof thumbstick drive with a timed port key and said, just stick this in the sheriff's computer. Kitty said, um, this might take a while cause I really don't want to be seen on camera. Harry nodded and took out a smoky quartz. Stand still, this will feel like someone is dripping a running egg over you. The quartz glowed with a lumos and vanished back into his inventory as Harry cast disillusionment on Kitty causing her to slowly become invisible. Harry could still sense her presence in space and knew she looked down at her own hands while Jean gave a smile at the novelty of such a thing and Warren looked impressed. Kitty exclaimed, whoa, this is like, so cool. Harry sighed and said, you can still be heard and you're not entirely invisible. Light just moves around you so if you stand still you're fine, but if you move, then people will see what looks like a mirage of bending light. Kitty said, still, this will totally make this job a cinch. She then walked directly into the wall and Harry pulled a screen and keyboard out of his bag and waited. Moments later the screen showed a connection was established and Harry started opening up and downloading files. The thumb drive had a notice me not on it and if Harry had not drawn their attention to it when he handed it to Kitty, they would not have even looked at it. A few moments Kitty returned and Harry cast non-verbal finite incantatum to restore her to the land of the visible. To cover it up he said, just in time, I wasn't sure how long that would last. Kitty looked surprised and said with a bit of heat, couldn't you have warned me? Warren said, calm down Kitty, everything worked out fine after all. Just don't assume you can rely on stuff like that in the future alright? It's better to rely on your own skills after all. Without looking up from his computer screen, Harry pointed at Angel and stated what he said. Jean noticed Harry had gone through several pages worth of information and asked, so what do we have? While still scrolling through the details, Harry answered, well, the only kid who was actually taken from the orphanage was taken from the street in front of the orphanage. Two others were taken from the grade school the orphans are attending and two others taken from the houses of friends they were playing or staying with. All within the last three days. Kitty sighed and said, school is starting early here for them huh? Bummer. Jean rolled her eyes and Warren smirked at the specific detail she chose to pay attention to. Jean looked in the direction of the orphanage and said, whatever the professor felt from here is definitely coming from that direction. This whole place feels like it is covered in cotton. Warren said, so we have our next destination. Harry said, I'd like to investigate the site of the other kidnappings to see if I can find anything the police missed. Warren considered it and said, take Jean with you. If you find anyone who knows anything useful, see what you can dig up. Although the man was clearly advocating the use of telepathy to invade the privacy of the minds of others, no one cared at this point as children's lives were on the line. Harry and Jean headed over to the school and Harry cast a notice me not under the idea, do not notice we are not supposed to be here. Once they entered the hallway, Jean asked, what did you do, I'm not even having to use my powers to get them to ignore us. Harry turned back and smiled but remained silent. 
They arrived at the location where one of the kids were taken and there was a burnt circle with various burnt symbols on one of the walls. Harry released some mandalas of dimensional energy and had them spinning and scanning the various energies in the areas. Jean watched him do this and flatly accused, you don't even need those gems, do you? Harry continued scanning while answering, nope. Then why continue with the act? A few reasons. Until I'm strong enough, it's best to downplay my abilities and my threat level. I'm also looking forward to the day when someone tries to take advantage of my reliance on gems and gloats to my face that without them I'm powerless. I promise to show you the memory of that guy's face when he realizes the truth. Wait, it's a prank. Among other things. You'd know that already if you read a little more about me. Harry's mandalas glowed red, then gray, then orange. The feeling of the mandalas also provided sensory feedback which gave Harry far more information than just the color did. Harry let the mandalas scatter and said, this portal was to a different realm. I can't reopen it from this side accurately so I can't track them down. Harry knew about demons, he knew how to control demons, and he knew how to counter demons. What he did not know was demon magic. Such tomes did not exist in Kamartaj, so the makeup of demon magic was unknown to him and trying to track the other side of the portal was like reading directions in an unfamiliar language without a map. Jean recognized Harry's frustrated face and asked, not good news. Harry filled her in and they headed back to meet up with Warren and Kitty. While Harry had been snooping, Warren had directly knocked on the door of the orphanage and introduced himself and asked a few questions. When they met back up, Warren explained to Harry that Nanny was a kindly old woman who looked very worried and said she had decided the kids would have to stay in the orphanage until the mess sorted itself out. If it were not for what he already learned from Harry's investigations, the place would not seem suspicious. Warren claimed through the door he could see various children doing various activities and playing around. Deciding they needed a second look, the group returned to the orphanage once more. The perimeter had various security cameras so unless Harry made Kitty invisible again, she wouldn't be able to sneak up to the wall and get inside again. However although they were some distance from the building, Jean claimed she could still get a read on the mines inside if she put some effort into it. They gave her about 10 minutes and when she was done, Harry didn't have to be a mind reader to know she was enraged. Warren took a step back when Jean opened her eyes just from an impression of the fury he could tell she felt. Mirroring Jean from earlier, Harry asked, not good news. Jean lost all composure and practically snarled, that woman is a monster. She and her partner, someone who actually calls himself Orphan Maker, find young mutants and kill their parents. They then use some kind of drug, something she calls fairy dust, to make the kids forget their parents and she takes them with her. Kitty fell backwards in shock, that's, that's horrible. Tears started running down Jean's face as she continued through grit teeth, my niece and nephew are in that building. They killed my older sister and made my family forget her. Warren nearly shouted, what? Jean held back her own sobbing while glaring at the orphanage walls and said, my sister has been out of contact with my parents for almost a year. They, they killed her. They killed her and took her children. Harry put his hand on Jean's shoulder and used his own psionic gift to enter Jean's mind and radiate a field of calm. Harry said directly to her mind, Jean, I promise you, no matter what, they will pay all right. I swear that to you. When Harry felt the peak of Jean's fury recede, he took her into a hug and held her as she started crying over the loss of her family. After Jean recovered, Warren said, the children are our priority here. What exactly is Nanny's plan? She didn't exactly look formidable. Jean answered, what you saw wasn't her. There are hologram projectors on the property, what you saw was a hologram. The real. Nanny, is in the basement preparing weapons for a counterattack. Kitty asked, what's her deal? I mean why would anyone do that? Jean took in a few breaths to calm herself before answering, she doesn't think she is doing anything wrong. She actually thinks she is rescuing children and giving them a loving home. Her mind is broken. It's filled with nursery rhymes and children's stories. Warren asked, what about the other one, Orphan Maker? Jean said, I can't get a read on him. He's in the basement too. He's wearing a cybernetic suit and is loaded with advanced weapons. The suit is built into him. He can never take it off. Kitty asked, why? Jean shook her head. I don't know. There's a reason, but I couldn't get a read on it. Harry looked around and said, I have a plan to rescue everyone, but it's not a nice one and no one is going to like it. His energy senses could tell that the grounds around the perimeter had been altered and he'd spent the last few minutes analyzing it. Warren sighed and called the remaining X-Men from the Blackbird. 
He didn't want to have to listen to a plan he wasn't going to like more than once. The group gathered on the other side of a hill near the orphanage. There were no buildings or streets, only trees, so it was not being monitored by anyone. Warren went over the details they found at the sheriff's office and the orphanage before Scott spoke up, so what's the plan? Harry sighed and said, there is a transfer circle written into the ground around the orphanage. It's been there for at least a week. It's limited in that it can only be activated at dusk, an hour from now, but when activated, everything within the circle will be moved to the destination point. My plan is to wait at the edge of the security perimeter and gather everyone within the circle before it goes off. That is likely to send us to where the other children were taken and we can mount an offensive to rescue them. Scott immediately objected, wait, you're gonna let the rest of the kids get kidnapped and let them get caught up in a fight between us all? Harry nodded, they're mutants too, they won't be defenseless. Scott replied, they're kids. That's not acceptable. Harry blankly stared at Scott and said, well, since you elected to speak up, you must already have a better idea. I'm all ears. Scott fidgeted and said, well, no, but we're not going through with this plan. We should think up a different plan together. Harry continued staring blankly at him and stated, I can't guarantee the transfer circle will activate if the orphans are missing. That's probably why it hasn't gone off yet, they weren't all there until now. I have no means of knowing where the kidnapped orphans are. I'm confident I can get us back no matter where we are taken but if we are not taken, the missing orphans are never coming back on their own. This plan takes into account the limits of everyone here. You can't just hope our limits increase because the outcome of those limits are not acceptable. If you think we should rely on a miracle instead of our own abilities, you shouldn't have bothered coming. Scott visibly flinched at that and looked over the group in the hope someone would have a better idea. He knew he didn't have one but couldn't accept that putting the lives of others at risk was ever acceptable. Warren sighed and said, Scott, we don't have another way to save everyone. If you don't like it, then become stronger and wiser, so that in the future you'll have better options. That goes for all of you, he gestured to the remaining X-Men. Harry double-checked to make sure the X-Men each had one of his trinkets and they assembled at the edge of the orphanage's security field. He layered a weak notice-me-not over the group and waited in silence. Thirty seconds before dusk, Harry signaled for the group to move in. Alarms echoed from the sirens in the property and floodlights illuminated the area. By the time the group reached the building, the last light of the sun vanished behind the horizon and the sky shifted to dark red. Once the scenery changed, Harry got out a diamond and caused it to glow for a moment before he conjured more scanning-type mandalas. Sorcerer Magic was very good at scanning dimension and spatial coordinates. The group quickly noticed that the haunting red sky was filled with winged, purple-skinned creatures of various sizes and forms. The moment Harry confirmed his readings, he paused. The location had shifted to a corridor of limbo. It was not easy to directly take mortals to another plane, but this corridor was basically created to be a welcoming mat. That was good news, getting them back wouldn't be difficult. The good news ended there however. Harry was pretty certain anyone who wanted mutant children wouldn't be too high up on the food chain when it came to demons but he realized he had miscalculated. Limbo was one of the stronger infernal planes and a demon who could make a corridor to Limbo was not someone who could be easily trifled with. Harry couldn't move very far while paused, but he was able to get a better idea of the surroundings and the enemy numbers. Thankfully the demons were just grunts. He couldn't spot a single elite in any of the groups he spied. Of course those groups numbered about 5,000, but the situation wasn't hopeless. Demons didn't like to share so they wouldn't swarm a group in large numbers. That meant it would be a series of group battles. Harry unpaused and shouted, Scott and Jean with me, we're going to rescue the kids, everyone else, hold the position and protect the orphans. Once we've gotten the kids we can get out of here. Harry technically wasn't in charge but this situation was simply too bizarre and the group wouldn't panic as long as they had a plan. Warren recognized the situation and shouted, take positions and do as he says. He removed his coat and unfurled his wings in a display that had the demons watching flinch back. Wings like that were intimidating to demons after all. Harry ran forward with Scott and Jean following behind. Harry activated a spell on his backpack which caused all the gems within to fly out and circle him while emitting light with a constant lumos. It had no effect but looked like a special move to anyone who paid attention. Harry figured he'd use this type of setup to go all out when in front of witnesses. Harry released multiple cutting spheres which exploded on contact with demons and shredded anything in the area to ribbons. Scott blasted everything in the direction they were heading to clear the path and most demons took serious damage from his blasts though it only had a concussive effect on humans. 
Jean simply grabbed any nearby demon and psychically threw them into other demons. A minute into their arrival, a massive magic circle appeared over the orphanage and spun around. The walls and roof of the building were torn to pieces and drawn into the spinning circle, leaving the occupants exposed. Harry paused once more and rechecked the layout. He confirmed the point of origin of the spell and the position of the caster. It was about eight feet tall with blood-red skin and a head that looked like a cross between a horse and a crocodile. Behind him seemed to be a ritual staging area but Harry wasn't close enough to analyze it. Harry unpaused and said, that guy's our target, we take him out and we win. Scott and Jean confirmed his position and along with Harry charged forward. Harry paused every couple of seconds to confirm the situation of the various battles. Angel, Pixie, and Nightcrawler had taken to the sky. Nightcrawler couldn't fly, but he could teleport behind an airborne demon, wrap his tail about the demon's neck, then fall and throw the demon into another demon. Angel's flying abilities did not lose out to the demons at all in air maneuverability and his punches could knock out any demon who closed in on him. Pixie wasn't a melee fighter but her pixie dust could cause anyone to hallucinate and she'd been spreading it around the demons causing them to either attack the air or attack each other. On the ground, Spike had been providing artillery support to Angel by shooting down any targets Angel or Nightcrawler disabled. Rogue seemed to have borrowed a bit of Iceman's powers and both of them were making a wall of ice to provide cover and freeze any demons who got close enough in place. Not all could, but several demons capable of magic did try to fire or fry the X-Men, but from the perspective of the X-Men, their aim was terrible and it was not a concern. A number of the orphans were putting up just as much of a fight. There was a giant 10-foot tall teddy bear standing over one of the little girls that had been grabbing and tossing demons around. A pair of red-headed twins seemed to be working together to freeze some demons in place before shattering them while another kid seemed to be able to control smoke. Shadow Cat was sticking around the orphans and if one was about to be attacked, she would grab them and make them intangible for a moment. Besides the orphans and X-Men were two rather noticeable figures. One was a person in an egg-shaped suit that appeared to have goggles over it and red lipstick where the mouth would be. The other was coated in metal which looked similar to how Colossus appeared when using his power. That one was probably Orphan Maker, the one who Jean said was basically a cyborg. His entire body appeared metallic and he wore a protruding mask and armor. In both hands were what appeared to be advanced weaponry. Harry decided to ignore them for the moment, but next when he unpaused, the pair started attacking Shadowcat. The egg person shouted, you wolves are here for my lost little lambs. Get them Peter. They wish to take these children away from those who love them. From the metallic suit came, in a voice that appeared to be that of a child's, nah, you bad guys aren't taking away my friends. He started unloading shot after shot at Shadowcat who had to stay intangible to avoid getting turned into Swiss cheese. Harry Operat behind the Tin Man and shot an overpowered stupefy into his back. The force of the magic sent Orphan Maker out of the ruined building into the outskirts where a group of demons quickly descended onto him. The Egg Woman shouted, Peter no. Nanny is coming for you, and rushed out, but the hordes of demons blocked her path and she could only watch as the demons started ripping the metallic pieces from the immobile cyborg. Harry Operat back and used a vanishing charm on some of the gems around him to make it look like they were spent in doing that. Although energy can resist magic, that was only true for sentient energy which required life force to be mixed in. This meant that cyborgs powered by external means were as vulnerable to magic as any non-magical if they weren't properly shielded. More so in fact as the system which ran that man's suit was now completely corrupted and unless he was dragged to a computer and had his suit's OS completely reinstalled, he wasn't going to move again unless he was a technopath who could fix his OS without an interface. Jean and Scott continue to clear a path towards the boss demon and finally get his attention. Until this point, the red demon had its back turned and was preparing something within a ritual circle. The creature growled and shouted, Incompetence and fools, must I do everything myself? Harry wasn't in the mood for witty banter so he directly shot out a widespread finite incantatum at the demon and the ritual circle behind him but it had no effect. The demon shouted, You dare challenge I, Nastir in my own realm? I shall take great pleasure in destroying you all. The demon now confirmed to be Nastir summoned black flames and red lightning which gathered around him. Harry spread his arms out and seven rings surrounded the trio and cancelled out the magics Nastir had cast at them. Nastir gave a nasty sneer and said, a sorcerer should know better than to fight a realm master in his own realm. He screeched into the air and the space itself seemed to warp and fold around the group. Harry paused and walked over to the ritual circle behind the red demon. That was twice now Nastir had claimed ownership of the realm, but Harry knew that Limbo was Belasco's realm. 
however Nastir was currently giving a display of space control that only the Realm Lord should have. Once Harry looked over the ritual circle in detail, he knew what the demon was up to. This was an offering ritual. He was offering the souls of innocent mutant children to Limbo in exchange for its favor and in doing so he would gain power equal to Belasco's within Limbo. Of course, even if they were equal, Nastir would have to fight Belasco for true ownership of the realm which was easier said than done. Thankfully the ritual wouldn't complete itself unless the offering was accepted which required more than what it had now. That meant the kidnapped kids were held within and could be rescued. Nastir actually shouldn't be able to use a realm lord's power before the ritual was complete, but it looked like he was basically borrowing it in advance. If the ritual failed, he'd suffer a debt but he was pretty confident in his success so he probably didn't care about that. Harry unpaused and used another spell from the Grand Grimoire. He'd practiced a few of them using wizard and sorcerer magic with the Ancient One and was one of the reasons he had confidence he could escape. Six mandalas appeared around Harry and Scarlet Red Ethereal Chains launched from them and spread through the air before fading away. The movement of space caused by Nastir's domain control slowed to a crawl as the space itself was bound in place. If Nastir wanted to fight, he'd have to do it like a man. Scott hadn't been staring off into the distance and Jean hadn't been filling her nails while Harry and Nastir exchanged blows. Scott had been firing his concussive beams at Nastir and the demons around him and even the ground nearby while Jean had been throwing everything at the red demon with everything she had. Nastir snarled and conjured black hell fire and shaped it into a massive creature. Nastir shouted orders to all the demons around him, destroy them now. Their fight however was interrupted by the sound of a massive roar behind them. The whole group turned and found a behemoth-sized, misshapen demonic creature then seemed to be devouring the other demons. It didn't eat them, its flesh simply covered and assimilated the demons and became larger and larger. Harry shouted to Scott, Scott, hold him down for 10 seconds. Scott nodded and Harry took Jean's hand and entered her mindscape. Within he said, Jean synchronize your emotions with mine. Jean didn't argue and felt the righteous fury Harry felt towards Nastir, Orphan Maker, and Nanny. The complete understanding that the world was better off without them and the desire to see them burn for their atrocities. Standing behind Scott, Harry rose his hand along with Jean's into the air as a flicker of flames ignited in their palm. Jean didn't know what it was, but it burned with her fury and she focused her emotions along with Harry's into it and the flame grew larger and larger. Scott had removed his visor and was blasting Nastir with literally everything he had. The wannabe realm lord was forced back a step but was able to shield himself through the use of his black magic and domain control. When the flame reached the size of a pumpkin, Harry said, get down Scott. Scott closed his eyes and collapsed into exhaustion as Harry and Jean threw their arms forward, the flame shooting directly at Nastir who thoughtlessly commanded his own flame creature to block it. The flame passed through the hellfire construct without slowing down and struck Nastir who thought to block it with a powerful magic shield in his hand. The fire burned through the magic and in an instant, his arm was set ablaze. He shouted, no. How can this be? He tore his own arm off but his shoulders started burning the moment the flesh was removed. Phoenix fire burnt the body, mind, and soul after all. Nastir tore a hole in space and immediately entered it, running for his life. The ritual circle broke and half a dozen children appeared on the ground. Harry shouted, Scott, guard the kids, we'll get the others to come grab them and get out of here. Scott was used to Harry's shouts by now and called back, got it. Harry and Jean ran over to see the titanic creature that was still devouring demons. The army of several thousand had been reduced to only a few hundred. Nanny was on her knees staring at the creature. She said, my poor, poor Peter. Harry asked, that thing was Orphan Maker. Within turning to face him she answered back, he was covered for his own protection and for the protection of others. His flesh would permanently fuse with the body of anyone he touched, gaining greater strength and power, but his mind regressed with each person and he couldn't control it. The nightmarish creature would soon finish with the demons and it would start with them. Harry doubted there was a mind left inside that being. Harry held his hand out, palm face up before Jean and she took it after understanding his intentions. Their righteous fury synchronized once more, and far faster than it had last time, a massive ball of flames emerged. Unlike the demon who Jean didn't like on principle, this orphan maker was the one who killed her sister. She wouldn't want to save him even if she could, and he was so beyond saving, there wasn't the slightest trace of remorse for what she was about to do. The reason Harry was making Phoenix fire with Jean was that her psionic path rank was far higher than his and even if the Phoenix wasn't awake within her, she was still its avatar and she was born capable of making Phoenix flames, even if she didn't know how to before. 
The massive fireball became larger than a house and got the attention of the blob of demonic flesh that was already over 10 stories tall. Slits emerged all over the creature and they turned to mouths which roared at the fire and their presence. Without needing to throw it, the fireball lifted from their hands and seamlessly shaped itself into a firebird and let loose a screech of outrage that embodied Harry's and Jean's fury at the monstrosity. Cords of flesh shot out like spears at Harry and Jean, but the firebird flew forward and every piece of flesh that passed through it was burnt to nothing, not even leaving ash. Harry covertly pulled out a baseball-sized crystal covered in inscriptions and runes and used a switching spell on it with a rock near the demonic flesh to get the crystal near the creature. The phoenix-shaped blaze collided into the flesh and consumed it in fire. The remaining demons that had not already left fled at their fastest speed as the massive creature was rapidly burning away. Harry watched the burning monster and could only sigh. The being hadn't consolidated any of its power so it was low density and easy to burn, like a giant pile of papers. Nastar on the other hand was like an ancient tree and far more dense when it came to power and life force. He'd probably survive, though the backlash from the ritual combined with the damage from the phoenix fire meant he would be rather weakened for a very long time. Harry led Jean back to the others and they ran over to where Scott was and took the children back to the destroyed orphanage. Eventually Orphan Maker had burnt to nothing. There wasn't even smoke or a smell. Without anyone noticing, Harry used the switching charm once more to get the crystal again before placing it back into his inventory. The switching charm usually can't be used on any item with magic but Harry made the vessel himself so it was an exception. Phoenix Fire burnt anything and the result was pure life force. Harry couldn't absorb it to level up, but he wasn't going to leave such a massive amount of Phoenix Fire refined life force for someone else to take. It could prove useful later. The space within the corridor seemed to shudder. Harry did some readings and confirmed that in an hour or so the space supporting the corridor would collapse and force everyone remaining there into limbo. That of course was only if Belasco himself wasn't trying to collapse it from the outside which Harry wouldn't put past the demon lord. Using Kurt's teleports, the kids were quickly assembled in the ruined orphanage. Scott looked around the shaking space and said, everyone's here, let's go. Harry said, okay, give me a moment. Actually there is an extra. Harry sent a banishing charm at Nanny who was mopping in a corner and directly ejected her from the area. Before anyone could say anything, Harry created a red mandala which spread out and caused the red sky to shift to a star-filled night sky. Harry's mandala confirmed that four hours had passed on Earth while they were in limbo which was why it was night though only a few minutes had passed since dusk. Ignoring Scott's ranting about leaving Nanny in hell, Harry directly entered the orphanage's basement and connected to the computers within. The machine fogging up Xavier's and Jean's senses was in front of him and he wanted to know how it worked and who built it. Though the computer had scans of the files which showed the blueprints, much of it was redacted. Harry had to use a few filters to get details from the redacted parts. When he finished, he only had one question. Who is Mr. Sinister? If you like this content, don't forget to like and subscribe. See you later, bye-bye.